Chronic diarrhea. Another definition. Greater than four weeks. Steatorrhea. This then means, steata means lipid. For example, you've heard of uh, steata hepatitis or steatosis in the liver. And that would be accumulation of lipid. So steato, the prefix means lipid. In this case, steatorrhea is defined as seven grams per day of fat. That's a lot of fat that you're losing. Why? Because of malabsorption. Why? Oh, maybe uh, gastronoma, maybe celiac disease, in which there is going to be destruction of the microvilli. And uh, when such an event takes place, there'll be malabsorption. And so therefore, the, uh, the stool that, you're, that, is, that is being evacuated is going to be highly rich in lipid. And so therefore, is going to uh, be extremely uncomfortable for the patient. Abdominal pain and cramps with diarrhea, chronically. Systemic symptoms such as fever, weight loss, arthritis. Uveitis could be seen with chronic diarrhea. And signs of nutritional deficiencies because over a long period of time with chronic diarrhea, you can only imagine that you're losing quite a bit of nutrients. Let's take a look at evaluating your chronic diarrhea. Stool studies. Culture. O and P stands for ovum parasites. And C. diff assay, perhaps, if you're suspecting a patient being in a hospital. Antibiotics, therefore clearing everything out. C. diff wins the battle. End up having diarrhea secondary to C. diff. Fecal leukocytes and osmolar gap. Let's take a look at that osmolar gap. The equation is 290, which is approximately your plasma osmolarity. From that, you subtract your cations, which include sodium plus potassium. Multiply that by 2. A 72-hour stool collection for volume and fat would be oftentimes a gold standard if you're worried about malabsorption. And then stool, phenolphthalein, for laxative abuse, though taken off the market by FDA. Just know that as being a historic fact. Let's go into malabsorption. Now, the evaluation that you want to conduct with malabsorption, the xylose test, hydrogen breath test, Serum vitamin, iron, ferritin measurements with malabsorption. Endoscopy, you want to check to see as to whether or not uh, is everything okay in the intestine. There's something called a wireless caps endoscopy for small bowel. A radiologic study, small bowel series is very important for you, especially radiologically. And maybe perhaps your uh, CT enterography. So these are all evaluation for carbohydrates, Maybe you're looking for uh, organisms. Obviously, you're looking for issues where uh, maybe your patient is iron deficient, maybe because of uh, uh, blood loss and vitamins as such. Fat-soluble, water-soluble vitamins, all depends. Our topic now with infectious. This is diarrhea. Invasive bacterial diarrhea is my topic. All that I'm going to do here is just list the organisms. I'll give you a little bit of explanation, but not a whole lot. This is more micro. Shigella, quite common, invasive bacteria. Salmonella, different species of salmonella that may result in types of diarrhea. Vibrio parahemolyticus, a diarrhea that might be found with uh, shellfish. E. coli, e. hemorrhagic, staph aureus, extremely quick with that type of diarrhea. Within six hours of consuming of stuff like potato salads, may present with diarrhea. Yersinia enterocolitica. This is the one in which at times will simulate your right lower quadrant pain, mimicking that of appendicitis. Here we have Campylobacter jejuni. It is the most common cause of uh, gastroenteritis in the United States. Campylobacter jejuni. And we have Vulnificus. We hear this every once in a while down in the Gulf. And that's because uh, um, you have a patient that's been swimming and the waters have been affected in the Gulf. And oftentimes these patients have pretty severe diarrhea to the point where they are increasing risk of mortality. That is no joke. And they have Aramenis hydrophilia. The non-invasive side, we have Staph aureus, Clostridium perfringens, E. coli, Vibrio cholera, and we have Bacillus cirrus. Bacillus cirrus could be fine with, well, you've heard of refried beans and such or 
uh, rice that's been um, reheated. But then you've also heard of tacos, right? So uh, carbohydrates and foods that have been reheated in which bacillus will play a role. Talk about toxigenic bacterial diarrhea. So we're going to walk into a little bit more detail here. Where you have water diarrhea, but please note uh, that the feces does not contain leukocytes, WBC-free. Staph aureus, it's so ridiculously quick. Within six hours, mayo, mayonnaise at room temperature, don't ever do that. Put your mayo back in the fridge. Also, egg products, so this obviously refers to mayo. And we talk about potato salad, which also has the mayo in it. That's the common denominator. Clostridium perfringens, here, rewarming of pre-cooked food, quote-unquote, church picnic diarrhea. E. coli, traverse diarrhea, plasma-mediated, and rehydration, absolutely required, and maybe perhaps your co-trimethoxazole, the combination of sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim. With E. coli, remember, there's a huge range. If it's E. coli 0157H7, that then brings about undercooked beef, and you're thinking about your hemolytic uremic syndrome in that young child, correct? Whereas if it's E. coli and you're dealing with uh, what's known as ST and LT, and that's the one in which it is heat stable, in which it's uh, ST, and that ST is going to be dealing with your cyclic uh, uh, GMP, whereas if it's LT, then it's dealing with cyclic AMP, and those are things that you paid attention to early on in micro. It might be a good time for you to make sure that you're completely clear with different types of E. coli. E. tech, E. heck, E. coli, 0157H7. Verbi cholera, once again, this is a good one for you to review for sure. And here, we talked about this being a secretory type of diarrhea. Here, common denominator for all these organisms, no fecal leukocyte. And diarrhea is watery. Continue discussion with no fecal leukocytes would be bacillus. We talked about the rice that's been reheated, also tacos. It doesn't always, ha- always have to be Asian restaurants. It could be your Mexican restaurants. Bacillus. Clostridium botulinum. Well, let's say that you have a child that ends up developing, um, uh, consumes Clostridium botulinum. Spores. Now, the problem is the child, the baby, can't handle the botulinum. And so, therefore, it behaves like Botox in a baby. You've heard of floppy bo- baby syndrome, haven't you? That's exactly what happens. Uh, the Botox in an adult, obviously, as an adult, are immune system and immune status is competent, so therefore we don't have all flaccid paralysis of the entire body, right? But uh, if it's a baby, my goodness, yeah, I mean, the botulinum is going to affect the neuromuscular junction in a baby, resulting in floppy baby. 